we are going to get started. So first and foremost, happy Invasive Species Week, everybody. Um, my name is Alexis Hayfley, and I'm the Communication Outreach and Environmental Education Specialist for the Washington Invasive Species Council. And if you didn't already know, the council was established by the Washington State Legislature in 2006 to provide policy level direction, planning and coordination for combating invasive species throughout the state and presenting the introduction of others that may be harmful. We are pleased to be, singing, to, to be bringing this webinar to you today and would like to thank the Washington State Department of Ecology and Washington, Washington State University for partnering with us to hold this important webinar. In the webinar today, you will be hearing from subject matter experts as we explore the topic of flowering rush in the Columbia River Basin. But first, let's go over some housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted on our website. So if you have to duck out early for any reason or you know somebody that would be really interested in this topic, don't worry, we will have it saved and hopefully posted to our website next week. We expect today's webinar to last approximately one hour. That's including the presentation time and then a little bit of time at the end for question and answers. So as we're going through the presentation, if you do have any questions you would like to ask our guests, go ahead and write them in the question box and then I'll save them until the end and then I'll share them with our um, presenters today. And then please mute yourself as you log in to just avoid creating feedback um, so as not to disrupt anybody that's on the webinar. And then again, if you wanna use that message or chat feature, if you're having any issues, um, just type something in there and I'll get back to you right away. And then lastly, thank you so much. We're glad that you're here. And I would like to introduce Jennifer Andreas. Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> she's looking at me, um, joining us from Washington State University Puyallup Extension Office, and then Jennifer Parsons, who is coming to us from the Washington State Department of Ecology today. <laughs> um, so flowering rush is in a unique family, um, that, so it doesn't have any other species in its genus, it's, um, and no other genera in its family, so it's quite unique. It's native to Eurasia. It was initially introduced along the St. Lawrence River in, near Montreal in the late 1800s and um, then has more recently spread to other parts of the country likely as an ornamental pond plant. And I'll be talking a little bit more, more in a later slide about places where it was first seen in the Columbia Basin. Um, so as far as identification, it's it grows as both an emergent and a submerged plant and kind of everything in between. When it's flowering, it only flowers when it's growing emergent and the flowers um, are in a cluster up on the flower stalk which usually grows taller than the leaves and the flowers each have six tepals. So those are petal-like things, sepals and petals that are pinkish typically though they will kind of fade to white later in the, grow later in the summer. Um, and there's usually 20 or more of those per flower cluster. Um, the leaves are triangular, especially at the base where they come off a rhizome. Um, and those, when it's growing emergent, the leaves will tend to twist. So that can be a characteristic that helps in its identification. And they do tend to flatten towards the tip, so they lose some of that triangular shape, especially if it's growing as a submerged plant um, where the leaves can be a lot longer and more flexible. Um, the leaves are typically about three or so feet tall, and then the, the whole flower stalk um, is usually about four feet tall or so. Just kind of, that can be pretty variable. So the real key to its success is in its rhizome. It's very rhizomatous. It'll form branches on its rhizome when it's been established in an area for a while. That rhizome mat will get very thick. Um, so that's something to look for if you think you may have flowering rush is to dig up a little bit of it and see if it is rhizominous with those leaves all coming off the rhizome like um, all kind of tucked around each other. And the rhizome will form buds um, along its length in that picture on the left, lower left you can see the buds coming off of that rhizome and those are very um, tenuously attached to the rhizome. They'll break off really easily and that's how it spreads mainly is vegetatively through those rhizome buds and then also rhizome fragments. Um, it's very easily broken, especially if water levels fluctuate and waves hit it or animals walk across it, um, boat motors churn it up, um, that'll break it up and it spreads that way. Um, it, it has both triploid and diploid varieties. So the triploid has an extra set of chromosomes and those triploid plants 
don't make fertile seed. And um, I'll be talking about this a little more in the next slide, but so far we think most of the no populations in the Northwest are triploid. And so we don't think it's spreading by seed here. Um, in the diploid plants, we'll also sometimes make um, little bulbils in the flowers. That picture in the lower right-hand side is the bulbils. Um, they're at the base of the little flowers in the flower stalk, and those are also a vegetative reproduction strategy. So a little bit more about the genetics. Um, this is work that's done by John Gaskin. He works for the USDA out of Montana. And he's collected flowering rush plants or had people send them to him from all over the world and um, has done genetic analysis to determine how many varieties there are, in especially focusing on the invaded area. And it, you can see that most of the plants in the northwest are that genotype one. There is in the Columbia Basin one other genotype in an area near Wenatchee um, that is a different one, so it was probably an, a different inter introduction from a different base population. Um, and most of them, like I mentioned, we think are triploid. Um, all those um, blue ones seem to be triploid, except perhaps with the exception of the Yakima River population. There's a, a little bit of a question mark about those. They may they came out as diploid, although we have never seen it making seed, and myself and people who are better botanists than I have all looked for seeds in that population and haven't really seen any. So we're trying to answer that question as to whether or not that's diploid or triploid. Um, as far as why we're so worried about this plant is it's great at exploiting a wide range of habitats. It can grow in water that's very shallow or along the shoreline where it's only damp, clear out to water over 25 feet deep where it just grows as a fully submerged plant. Um, it can handle pretty much any kind of flow from river systems to um, just ponds that aren't flowing at all. Lots of different sediment types that has grown in rocky areas we've found it in cobble, gravel, silt, muck, um, in the Ponderay River. Um, they seen it growing out of a rock wall where just a little bulbil from one of the rhizomes got lodged and it started growing there. So pretty much anything is go a go as far as um, it colonizing it. It can withstand a wide range of temperatures. You can see in that picture on the left, it's completely dried out and yet the flowering rush is still going because its rhizomes are down where the sediment is still a little bit damp. That's an area that's just inundated in the spring. Um, and it also survives freezing temperatures in Flathead Lake where there's a lot of it and many other places where the water level is drawn down in the wintertime and the rhizomes are exposed to freezing temperatures. Um, that doesn't slow it down at all. It does just fine. It, it um, goes dormant and just comes right back in the spring. Um, so that's, it, that's one of its keys to its success is it's ability to exploit a wide range of habitats and then its ability to reproduce so successfully through those rhizomes and rhizome fragments. Um, we're seeing it spread really quickly. So as far as its impacts, um, it, you can see in the picture on the upper right that was taken in Flathead Lake by um, Peter Rice, who's been doing a lot of research on flowering rush there for quite a few years. Um, there's um, acres and acres of it out there. It crowds out the native plants that were there in that particular lake. Um, there weren't a lot of native plants in a lot of those areas, and um, so it's colonized area that used to be open water. Um, and when it does start to colonize an area, especially in riverine systems, um, then it causes sedimentation rates to increase, and then it creates kind of its own sediment, its own habitat, it changes the whole habitat, it'll change an area that used to be more cobbly into one that's more silty, and as the silt increases, it just increases the habitat value for the flowering rush, so then it increases more, or it spreads more quickly. Um, it'll also slow flow, so in the irrigation canal, you can see that was taken in southeast Idaho, where they've had a lot of trouble with it in irrigation canals. It'll um, pretty much stopped the flow in those canals, so they were having a really difficult time delivering water to their farmers um, until they found a way to control it. They're actually having to dig it out with a backhoe, um, a special rake that they've adapted onto a backhoe. 
in order to control it in those systems. So it's considered an ecosystem engineer because it really does change the habitat when it invades the system. Um, other impacts are economic. Of course, it's very expensive to control, and it also um, can, it changes the habitat, so it impacts fish habitat, which can have an economic impact. Um, it seems to provide great habitat for um, the snail that is part of the life cycle of the parasite that causes swimmer's itch. And so um, you can get a lot more swimmer's itch in areas with flowering rush, which can also translate into an economic impact um, because then people don't like to go there and swim anymore. This was in a lake, this happened in a lake in Northwest Washington that had a lot of flowering rush. And when we started controlling the plants there, the swimmer's itch went away, which um, there were several camps along the shoreline of the lake. And finally the swimmer, there the kids could swim in the lake again. Um, it also is great habitat for northern pike, which are apparently obligate vegetation spawners. So the fish, northern pike, preferentially spawn in flowering rush beds in Flathead Lake, where both of these invasive species co-occur. And the northern pike, if you saw the webinar yesterday about them, they are coming down the Columbia River system in tandem with flowering rush. And so the flowering rush, if it establishes, could provide additional habitat for pike, both for a cover because it, it's an ambush predator that likes to um, hang out in grassy areas. So it, the flowering rush provides perfect habitat for that. And it can also cover um, spawning gravels down in the lower picture. Um, that was in the area where it's just colonizing a gravelly area, but that will fill up with flowering rush and sediment over if it's given enough time. So a little bit more about its distribution in the Columbia watershed. Um, that yellow orangish line is the outline of the Columbia River Basin and the red dots are known flowering rush locations. Um, this is a map that is being hosted by the Washington State Department of Agriculture and Brant Carmen has been keeping it updated for us. Um, so thanks to him for that. And so we are always putting out the call for data if there are um, any people out there who know of flowering rush populations that aren't on the map, please let us know. Um, the, the main populations, um, or the oldest populations, are down there in southeast Idaho, where it was first discovered in the 1940s um, in the Snake River area, and that's where it's gotten into those irrigation canals that I showed earlier. And then the next spot where we knew of it in the northwest was in Flathead Lake, Montana, which is um, in the upper parts of the river basin as well, and that's, um, there's about estimated to be about 2,000 acres in Flathead Lake of flowering rush now, and it's come down out of Flathead Lake into the Clark Fork River system and gotten into Lake Ponderay in northern Idaho and then um, into the Ponderay River in Washington. And then there's a separate population in the Spokane River in Washington, um, and then another population, or that's gotten down into the, um, into, I don't think it's showing on this map, I thought it was, but um, in, it's also into Lake Roosevelt in, on the Columbia. And then there's another population in Lake Inyat in the Columbia River, and then also in um, the Yakima River where it's come down into the, um, into the Columbia River from the Yakima River. I think some of those points got moved, anyway. Um, on to the next slide, um, the, and so I was just going to mention a little bit more about the upper watershed. Um, like I said, in Flathead Lake, there's about 2,000 acres of it, so it's really well established in the upper watershed, which is part of the difficulty in managing this plant throughout the basin. It, the, the mother load of the plant is up in the upper watershed, and it's moving down on the current into the lower basin, into the lower um, watershed. So. That's a particular challenge. And in the lower parts, it's still mostly isolated patches, although, although they are filling in that, that picture in the lower left-hand corner. Is, you can just see the tips of the plants because it's growing out in water probably 8 to 10 feet deep. Um, and that used to be just probably five or six years ago, just a few isolated scattered plants. And now it's probably about five acres 
of pretty solid flowering rush, so it can really spread and fill in rapidly once it gets a place where it's happily growing. Um, so now I'm going to move on to control. Um, so the first line of defense has been hand pulling in areas where plants are just scattered and kind of just coming into a new area either when the water level is off we have tried doing some hand digging like in that lower picture that is very labor intensive and um and pretty um it's effective if you have just a few small patches but not effective if you have a large patch um, what happens more often, because in the Columbia River, at least, the flowering rush is usually growing in areas where the water, water level doesn't fluctuate all that much. So um, we hire divers, and they use a system called um, Diver Assisted Suction Harvesting, or DASH, which is just a suction hose that's attached to the boat. And so the diver goes into the water, and they're actually hand pulling the plants and then using that suction hose to move the plants up onto the boat so it increases their efficiency. They're not really suctioning up the plants off the bottom or the sediment or anything like that. Um, and so then the next, another method that's also used for pioneering populations that are just getting established in an area is covering. Um, and so you use landscape maps or fabric or something similar, some textile. People have sometimes use burlap as well um, to cover the plants and just shade them out. Um, it's been used on both submerged and emergent plants. You really have to anchor the material down well using either sandbags or gravel bags or rocks. Sometimes the material is built on a frame to make it easier for the diver or snorkeler or people to handle the matting just makes it a little easier to manage. Um, that picture on the lower right-hand corner is showing some, fly I don't know if you can see it, but there's some flowering rush growing out from under a um, cover that is probably in 15 or 20 feet of water in the Columbia River. So, um, and also the picture in the middle or on the left-hand side also shows flowering rush growing up through a gap in the covering. So you really have to Put the cover over a much larger area than you think because it will grow sideways and try and get out from under that cover. Um, and also this is often or sometimes used in conjunction with the diver hand pulling. Um, that seems to be a pretty effective method where they've been using it in the Columbia River around McNary Dam um, doing some hand pulling and then covering with the, the mat to get any plants that didn't get pulled up. So the next um, thing I was going to talk about are herbicides that have been tried on flowering rush. And I'm not going to go over all of these herbicides. This is just to show you how many different herbicides have been tried. So there are a lot of people working on trying to figure out how to kill this plant. Unfortunately, it is a pretty tough one to kill with herbicides. Um, so I'm just going to kind of summarize by talking about the herbicides that have been shown to be the most effective so far. Um, so first, talking about, and I'm, I'm going over by the three different kind of growth forms that people are treating flowering rush at. So the first one is spring bare ground treatments. This is a treatment method used in places like Flathead Lake or Lake Ponderé, or we hope to use it this spring in Lake Roosevelt, where the plants are high and dry. The water is off the areas um, in the spring when the plants are just starting to break dormancy. Um, and so you treat it, and then the ideal situation is to have the water still off for at least two weeks after treatment so that the plants have plenty of time to soak up that herbicide prior to it being inundated in the spring as the water level is brought back up. Um, the leaves need to be starting growth before the treatment takes place. They say you need at least a le an inch or two of leaf growth in order for um, the plant to take up the herbicide so you know it's not still dormant. Um, but you can, there's some data in the lower left that just shows that they are getting pretty good efficacy with repeated treatments, um, especially with amazapir, which is the habitat in those graphs. Um, after four years of treatment, they were getting about 97% control with that. But 
there's still a lot, you know, even with 97%, you still have 3% out there. So if you walk away from it at that point, it's just going to fill back in in these areas where the plants are really well established. So we still quite, haven't quite gotten to an eradication um, method yet with that technique, although it is a very good control technique. Um, so then the next one is treating emergent plants in the middle of the summer. Um, this is what we've been doing along the Yakima River where the plants are mostly growing as emergents and um, we have been using glyphosate there which isn't as effective as imazapir. Imazapir is the one that's been shown to be the most effective although its label has irrigation restrictions and of course they use the Yakima River for irrigation so that's why we've been using glyphosate instead, but we are seeing some pretty good control. You can see those two pictures in the slide are a comparison from how the plants looked in 2015 compared with 2019, and that's five years of treating it every year. Um, there are still plants out there, so we're still plugging away at it, but it is definitely um, getting under control, and we're hoping eventually to switch to hand pulling or covering and, and get rid of the last of the plants at least in this one area. Um, so that is another method, but like, a, like with the um, bare ground treatments, it takes a lot of years of dedication and funding to, to keep it under control. So the other gr growth form that flowering rush has is when it's growing as a fully submerged plant. Um, and lots of different herbicides have also been tried on this, and really the only one that seems to be showing much promise is Diquat. And Diquat is a contact herbicide, um, and so typically it's thought to just kill the leaf. It doesn't really translocate down to the rhizome. Um, but so we think what's happening is it's particularly sensitive to the Diquat, so it doesn't take a lot of it to kill those leaves. And then it's slowly wearing out the rhizomes by continually to kill the leaves every year. Um, but it will grow back. You can see in the image on the bottom that's a comparison of the same area in Silver Lake and up in northwest Washington between 2010 and 2013 after three years of diquat treatment. Um, so it's clearing it out, but it hasn't killed it all the way. If, again, if you walk away from the treatment, um, if you haven't killed all the plants, they'll just grow back again. Um, the Corps of Engineers is trying some innovative um, techniques to try and corral diquat in the Columbia River with bubble curtain barriers. Um, so we'll see how that works in the coming years um, because diquat, it doesn't need a long exposure time, but you do need it in contact with the plants for about six hours anyway. And so in the big system like the Columbia River, you've got to either put a barrier up or these bubble curtains to keep the herbicide in, um, next to the plants instead of dissipating out of the area. Um, so now I'm going to switch over and Jen, the other Jen is going to take over. Thanks, Jen. Um, as Jen Parson said, I'm going to talk about um, the biocontrol research that's going on and then also um, some of the, the uh, work we're doing collaboratively with, within the Columbia Basin. Um, so as Jen has, has been talking about, the controlling flowering rush is really challenging. Um, and there's been a lot of work done and continues to be done, but I think there started to be some concern that there, we, were, we were likely to see flowering rush become um, such a problem and so widespread that we would ultimately need a biocontrol agent for um, it's as, an, an, as an additional tool. Um, so uh, back in 2012, we started having discussions about the feasibility of biocontrol. Um, and the great thing about flowering rush is because it's the only species within the Budimaceae family, this increases the likelihood that we're going to find a host-specific biocontrol agent. So oftentimes, we struggle with finding something specific when there are a lot of closely related plant species. Um, so we're kind of in luck with that. Um, biocontrol um, may provide a really a long-term solution, um, and, and it is used successfully across the landscape in many countries. So we formed a consortium in 2013, and this was a partnership between um, CABI Switzerland, which I'll talk about in a minute, and several states and provinces. So CABI is an international not-for-profit organization, and they are experts in biocontrol research and development. 
And so they really have the, um, the expertise to be able to take on a task like this and do the research for us. So once we started looking at that, then we needed to pursue funding, and this is usually where biocontrol programs get caught up, is, is not having enough funding. And we were really fortunate um, that we, we ended up having a lot of people who were interested in providing um, some funds towards uh, biocontrol uh, development. And this is pretty typical for biocontrol programs. There's rarely just sort of one giant pot of money available. So instead, um, we pool our money together in, through a consortium. And we're able to, through the, the pooling of many sources of funding, uh, build robust uh, development programs. So you can see in this, uh, we have quite a few different um, partners who have provided funding, Montana, Washington, several federal agencies, um, British Columbia and Alberta, and some tribes. So it's been, in that way, we've been very, very lucky. So once we had the funding in place, CABI was able to start looking for um, for potential biocontrol agents through field surveys. So initially, they'll start with a literature survey where they look at what attacks it, um, what in the literature is known to attack it, and be um, monophagous, meaning it's only going to feed on flowering rush. After they uh, go through the literature, then they'll do field surveys. And you can see the areas that they have surveyed um, across Europe, um, and then Georgia and into Kazakhstan. And so they've been looking in a variety of places. Um, and every year we sort of expand that a little bit, uh, or we try to, in order to um, try to find potential uh, biocontrol agents that are out there. And this work is being done primarily by uh, Patrick Hafflicker, who is from Switzerland, Harriet Hintz, who is in Switzerland, and Carol Ellison, who's in the UK. And I just, um, all of this information that I'm going to present is their work. So although there are quite a few things that will attack flowering rush in the field, um, there, this is the list of species that are listed as being monophagous, meaning they will just feed, are, are known to just feed on flowering rush. And so for a variety of reasons, some of those um, insects have been eliminated. Either they are uh, listed as endangered in Europe, and that makes it hard to work with them, or some of them don't do enough damage. And so we've really uh, pulled out three specific um, potential biocontrol agents that I'm going to talk about today. The first one that we were interested in was Vagus nodulosus. And the reason we were pretty excited about this one is because the uh, larvae mine into the leaves and into the rhizomes. And we really wanted to hit the plant where it hurts, which would be in the rhizome. So um, once they started looking for it, they found more than they expected to. Uh, the adults live mainly underwater, and the larvae are developing from um, May through September in those leaves and rhizomes. One of the things that's been interesting, um, and I'll talk about why this matters in a minute, um, is that uh, it, it turns out the larvae will actually leave the plants and float or swim, it's not sure how, how active they are, um, to other plants. And this is pretty unusual behavior for a weevil, um, and, so, and it impacts the kind of studies that we need to do for it. It is overwintering as an adult, and by my understanding, it's overwintering under the water. So in order to test whether these biocontrol agents will be safe for release in the United States and Canada, we um, need to conduct host specificity testing. And so what this is doing is testing a variety of te um, test plant species that are closely related to flowering rush to make sure um, that, they, that nothing will be attacked. So between 2016 and 2018, they conducted sequential no-choice oviposition tests. And what this really means is when a female is starting to lay eggs, they expose her um, for, for a couple of days, two days, um, to, to one plant species. And so either she lays her eggs on that plant species or she doesn't. If she doesn't lay her eggs on that plant species, it's a, good, it's a strong indication that it's not an acceptable host. And so we can eliminate a lot of species by um, seeing whether any eggs are laid. Because if eggs aren't laid, on those species, then they won't. They then we won't have any problems with uh, larvae developing on them. So they um, looked at 45 different test plant species, um, and I didn't have time to go into those today, um, and did six replicates per species. Um, of those, for those results, um, there was a European species that was accepted um, for oviposition or egg laying, but just once. And so we, we this was potentially sort of an anomaly um, since we didn't see this species being chosen um, in other tasks. Um, so that, that's excellent news. We also saw some adult feeding on a North American species, Valcinaria americanus, 
and a um, fairly widespread um, Blixa species uh, that is not native to North America. The damage you can see um, to, on the right-hand uh, picture, that's the kind of adult feeding we're seeing. So still fairly minimal uh, in terms of the kind of adult feeding you might see on uh, a, a lot of these non-targets. So for the most part, the tests were completed in 2019, and we were feeling really positive about the direction of this. But once they determined that the larvae are actually leaving the plants um, and moving into other plants, that um, meant a whole new other kind of test had to be done. So now they, between eight, uh, 2018 and 2019, they conducted no-choice larval establishment tests. And so what would they do with these is they take two larvae, and they were exposing them to cut leaves of the test plant or the control plants for five days. And coming back after, after those five days to assess whether the larvae were alive or dead. They were able to test 30 test plant species. And for most of the test plant species, the uh, larvae was de were dead, meaning that they weren't able to feed on those non-target species. Um, but we, they did see that the larvae were developing on flowering rush, so that's an indication that the tests were. They found some feeding and alive larva on Limnobium levigatum, which is from South Africa, and Hydrocaris morsus renae, which is a European. Um, it's also listed as a, a weedy species on call, off commonly called frog, uh, European frog fish. So with all of this testing, we feel really strongly that Vegas nodulosius is um, highly host specific, and there will be more testing done during this uh, 2020 through the season just to confirm all of that. And we are hoping to put the um, petition for field release in uh, in either late 2020 or early 2021. The other species, uh, the second species we're interested in is a fly, Phytoleromyza. Um, and initially, we weren't, we weren't that interested in the fly because it only mined the larva were mining the leaves and stem, flowering stems, which we didn't feel like was going to do enough damage to the plant to really cause an impact. Um, but once they, Patrick started working on it, um, he found that when plants uh, were exposed to a female, just one female for three or four days, they were seeing so, that those plants were wilting within two to three weeks. And so that was pretty encouraging for us and really led us to uh, put a little more effort into this fly. So they began host specificity testing in, in 2019 and were able to test 11 test plant species um, and found no development. Um, throughout all of this, I should mention, the rearing process for all of these insects is, is um, still something that needs to be worked out and can be quite complicated. So oftentimes, they can only do so much um, testing because they only have so much insect material. The last, um, the last potential biocontrol agent that we're excited about is a white smut, Dosancia. And this is work being done by Carol Ellison. Um, she is in CABI UK. They tend to work a little more with pathogens. So the, um, it, as I said, this white smut has potential for high damage, and we do have other examples where white smuts have been used uh, to control mist flower in Hawaii and New Zealand that were incredibly successful. So they collected uh, the smut in Germany and France, and they've been working on figuring out its life cycle. Uh, pathogens tend to have fairly complex life cycles. So it has two spore types, and they attack the plant in different ways. Um, the, it is adapted to an aquatic habitat, and what's particularly cool about this uh, white smut is that it can infect plants that are growing completely underwater. So where we don't know exactly how well the insects will do in plants that are fully submerged, this smut has the potential to be um, impacting those, those submerged plants. The impact of the rhizome is still currently unknown, and that, that's all being researched. One of the struggles we've been having with Dosantia is that it's extremely genotype specific. And so this is often a challenge with pathogens where you can have um, a pathogen only attacks one kind of genotype. And so you can see in this picture, we have um, genotype one in the, in the background, that's, a, that's from South Dakota, and that is our most common um, flowering rush genotype, as Jen mentioned. Um, in the foreground, we have genotype two, which is in Bushy Lake, in Canada, um, and, and uh, the kind of Dosantia that we have has, is only attacking genotype two, it's not attacking genotype one. So we're working right now trying to find a strain that will go after our genotype one. So in 2020, the plan is to try and complete the testing for Vagus nodulosus. 
continue the host specificity testing for phytoleromyza, the fly, and then continue trying to find a good match for docentia and working on host specificity. In terms of the consortium, we want to call, we're always looking to cultivate North American partnerships. And so if you, if this is something that you think you would like to be involved in in one way or another, um, please do email me. Um, we do have a listserv that we, where we send out information and that's at the bottom of the screen. We're pursuing additional um, funding and as we get closer to putting the potential for releasing Vegas, we're beginning to talk about how to strategize for an implementation plan. So I'm going to jump now to the um, Columbia Basin CWMA, um, which is a group that uh, was put together um, several years ago. Um, this was a group uh, that was created um, by the good fortune of having some funding to do that. Um, Jen Parsons uh, was, was contacted by somebody at the Department of Ecology, Nate Loveliner, and he suggested that a grant be put into uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, so that we can develop this, this uh, cooperative weed management area. So WISC and Justin Bush uh, was able to do that, and we've received a $65,000 grant. And this allowed us to develop the Columbia Basin Cooperative Weed Management Area. And that was uh, probably would not have been possible without hiring a consultant. So the first thing that was done was hiring somebody to help manage us and keep us on track. Um, Part of this was having creating co-chair positions, steering committees, developing charters and bylaws. There is now a website with our logo, which you can see on the right, and I think it looks really nice. Um, and we also held a summit. So we brought together people from all over the Columbia Basin, and you know there were people uh, from Switzerland who came, and we had people from a variety of other areas across North America who came, and we all sat down together in a room um, and we learned about what each other is doing and we came up with a plan and then we developed this management plan. So these, you can see there's a lot of people who are on the steering committee partnerships um, and, and we're always interested in other groups. So if we're missing you, um, please do feel free to join us. So this, um, so once we had, it took us a while, but we got the flowering rush management plan. Um, you can see there's quite a few authors with it. And this was uh, completed in 2019. And there is, this is the uh, link to that plan, if you're interested. It's, it's um, got quite a bit of information within it. And we're really hoping that it will be beneficial in providing an excellent source um, resource for flowering rush management. Um, we're hoping it will help with finding additional funding, continuing and building partnerships, and, and also providing a path forward for basin-wide management. So what are we doing now with it after we've got the plan done? Um, the grant ended at the end of December. And so we met in December at, as, as, as part of another conference. And um, Jen and I can, will be the co-chairs for the next round. Um, and so we're still kind of figuring out exactly where we want to go with this, but we're hoping to if nothing else, continue to fund the consultant to keep us all organized. Some of the other things we're hoping this group will do is uh, we're, we're looking for an economic analysis. We need to figure out how, what, are, what is the cost of flowering rush across the Columbia Basin. Uh, we'd like to add treatment info to that web map that Jen pointed out earlier. Um, it hopefully will be a really powerful resource for people all across the region. Um, we would like to work more closely with other groups for future meetings um, and, and see how Flowering Rush can partner in with a wide variety of topics that are um, basin specific. We're always looking to increase membership, um, whether that's through irrigation districts and tribes. Uh, there's a strong Columbia Gorge CWMA, uh, the BPA, and through our county weed coordinators. So again, if you're interested, uh, please, uh, you can contact either me or Jen um, I think our information is available here, and, and um, we can get you signed up. So I'm going to hand it back over to Jen for the last few slides. Great, thanks. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on WERDA, which is um, some funding that has come to the Corps of Engineers in their Water Resources Development Act um, budget. It was, it got added to that budget um, by mostly by the efforts of the senators in Oregon because Oregon is very worried about flowering rush coming down the Columbia River. 
and they wanted to see more federal money going into its control. So a million dollars per year so far has been added to that budget, um, but it depends on each budget year. So um, it's not necessarily guaranteed in that the future is my understanding, but so far it's been in every year. Um, the money is coming as a 50% cost share for money that's already being spent by states or local governments like counties or tribes, um, but it can't be um, a cost share with other federal money. So federal agencies or other grants that are coming from a federal source aren't eligible as match for this um, money that's coming from this source. Um, and, and then um, <laughs> the last part of it is they still haven't been able to get through all the permitting hurdles and um, other bureaucratic technicalities in order to hand out any of the money yet. So there's, it's been three years now, so then now there's $3 million available. Um, so that's been a little bit frustrating, but we are hopeful that um, it will be available this coming year. Um, the last I heard, which was on a call with the Corps of Engineers last week, they're now aiming for mid-May to early June to be able to start handing that money out to the states that have um, developed projects. And the way it's working is there's kind of one main contact for each state, and then the money's gonna come from the Corps through the Pacific States Marine Fishery Service. Um, Stephen Phillips has been coordinating similar pots of money that are currently being spent on things like boat inspection stations, so it's kind of the same channel that that money is coming through. Um, so he's going to be also managing the flowering rush money, and then it's going to come to the states. And um, in Washington, we've submitted six projects so far, and there may be a seventh in the Spokane River. And I have those listed there, um, all the different projects that we've gotten so far. Idaho is submitting one large project being coordinated through their State Department of Agriculture. And then Montana is similarly submitting one large project. And Oregon, unfortunately, so far doesn't have any submitted because all of their flowering rush is on Corps of Engineers property. And so it's not eligible for this funding, although they could um, potentially submit some projects for additional survey and monitoring work. Um, I should have mentioned um, the initial initial legislation said it was just to be used for control work, but in the last funding cycle, the word survey and monitoring got added, so those activities can also be counted as, um, as match for this funding, which is really important because if you're trying to do an early detection and rapid response program, of course, you want your monitoring to be um, counted as well. So that's kind of the latest on WERDA. It's, it's kind of the future direction that, or the, the future funding source that we hope to increase the pressure on flowering rush into the future um, because the states and local governments are quickly becoming overwhelmed by the, by the um, control costs that are being incurred by flowering rush so far. So with that, we have just a slide of acknowledgments. This just to reiterate that this is we're reporting on work that's been done by a, a whole array of different people and funding organizations and um, people out on the ground actually doing the work. So we wanted to throw up some acknowledgments, and we've also kind of tried to mention people as we go along as well. Um, that, I guess we could take yeah. questions. Perfect timing. So we've got about five to seven minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to try to unmute everybody, and if I don't get feedback, you can just ask. But if I do get feedback, I'll let you know. Um, so right now, everybody should be able to talk. I've unmuted you, so you can speak, or you can just write me a question in the question box. And um, we can all just hang out here for a little bit while we wait on your questions.
Does anyone have any questions? If we don't have any questions, we might end a little bit early, but I want to make sure people on the phone and on the computer have a chance to ask any questions that they have. Um, Jason says, might have missed this in the presentation, but what is the flowering rushes tolerance to salinity? Hmm. Yes, two questions for salt tolerance. Yeah. That? I don't know if I've ever read that anywhere. I'm not sure. I haven't gotten down into the estuarine area of the Columbia yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Good question. Way to go, Trudy. You <laughs> stuck them out of the gate. <laughs> That's right. We have another one that says, uh, you're a lot better Latin names than I am, so you might know what this is. What is the impact of waterfowl if something is impacted by a biocontrol agent? Uh, Valtineria, yes. Um, so yeah, the question, what is the impact of waterfowl if Valtineria is impacted by biocontrol? We would not anticipate that, that um, it would be impacted. There, there is some light feeding, and, um, but there's some light feeding on the plant, which typically doesn't actually cause any long-term damage to the plant. And so uh, this would all be teased out in final testing. Um, but I, I really don't anticipate that that's going to be a, an issue at all. There will, should, biocontrol agents are very specific, and so there should not be any reduction in bell scenario in the long run. And then uh, Patricia says, the fact that it can colonize cobbles and gravels and streams or rivers seems like it would affect salmon spawning habitat. Is this part of the concern about its spread? Um, yes, that's part of the concern. And then Bill says, I'm wondering if aquatic vegetation rake was mentioned before he got logged in. Um, it, I mentioned it in the irrigation system control. They're using a rake on a backhoe to scoop the flowering rush and all of its rhizomes out of the irrigation canal as a control method. It, it has the potential to cause a lot of fragments, so it wouldn't be a good control method in an area where you're really trying to prevent spread. But the flowering rush was already pretty well established in those irrigation canals, so I think that's why they went with that. And then Tricia says, what about when all the bottomist is controlled by biocontrol agents? Um, would they move to Valsinaria? Oh, yeah, no. Um, that, well, first of all, we don't ever see full control. We don't see eradication when we use biocontrol. So that's the first thing. So there'll always be some, a flowering rush around. Um, we're just, the goal is that we're trying to manage it to bring, bring its populations down to below damaging levels. Um, Having said that, even if we get very high levels of biocontrol agents that drop the populations of flowering rush, they will not move on to other species. And so their populations will either disperse or they, their, the biocontrol populations will die off because they just don't have as much um, flowering rush plant material available. So there, there's not a risk that it will move on to other species when flowering rush is reduced. She referenced the purple loose strike biocontrol agent in an outbreak in Oregon. Yeah, that ago. is that's a very um, specific phenomenon called a spillover effect, in which we see uh, biocontrol agent populations building up very rapidly in large numbers, and they um, sort of out they outfeed their food source, and so then they fed very briefly on um, other plant material as sort of a spillover. And at that point, those adults were so desperate to eat, they would just eat anything. Uh, so they were eating species that are, were you know, at least somewhat palatable to them. But within about, I believe it was less than 10 days, that damage was completely gone. The, the biocontrol agents died off or flew away because it's not a sustainable food source. And so they can't lay eggs on it. Their young can't survive on it. So it's just more of a, a kind of flash in the pan, um, heavy feeding incident, but all of our plants uh, typically, plants can uh, withstand some heavy feeding, and they're able to bounce back. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. So, Loretta asks, is there a project going to be submitted by the Columbia Basin CWMA to receive funds from the Word of Funds? 
Um, not the CWMA itself at this point, because the funds are only matching on the ground control or monitoring or survey efforts, and the CWMA isn't really doing that kind of work at this point. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. That is all the time that we have.